Good morning. Welcome to the United Methodist Church of Plano. We are located in Illinois. My name is Steve Saunders. I have the great privilege of being the pastor here. Uh, today we're going to be in, we're going to take a couple verses out of 2 Samuel chapter 11, chapter 12, and then we'll be in Psalm 51. We'll tackle part of Psalm 51 today. Uh, hey, Colette, good morning. Uh, we have made some great strides in our growth in Christ, our trust in God, and, and our ability to be able to be, just to lay ourselves bare before him. Hey, Wayne, good morning. And to really be excited about the relationship God is calling us to with him, the, an intimate relationship, and we see it lived out in the Psalms. So today, we're going to tackle a couple diff difficult issues. I know we don't like to talk about it. And uh, most of the Psalms that we've been talking about, we, we've addressed on how God uh, walks with us through difficult times, how God listens to our prayers. Hey, Sue, good morning. How God is our defender and uh, um, how to receive forgiveness. And hey, Red, good morning. Hey, Kathy, good morning. <clears throat> But once in a while, we have to address sin, our own sin. And this is not uh, where the pastor stands back and beats people over the head with guilt. This is an acknowledgement, hey, Edna, good morning, uh, that every single one of us, uh, from the time Adam and Eve fell in the garden until now, we always have, we have an issue of sin that we have to deal with. As unbelievers, we have to come to the Lord to receive forgiveness that we would be eternally forgiven and have a seat at his heavenly banquet table. And even though we're saved, even though uh, those who have been converted, those who follow Christ, we still struggle. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with this battle within, the urge to go through to uh, obey our flesh instead of obeying the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, it still afflicts all of us today. We can't get away from it. I don't care how great the preacher is. I don't care how great the servant of God is. We still struggle with this sin nature. Now, when we've gone down the road for some time of following Christ, the idea is and the hope is, is that as we're going through the sanctification process, we sin less. And sometimes we backslide. And we have to call on the grace of God to restore us. And we're going to get a glimpse of that story today through King David. Now David uh, takes a bit of heat. Because on one hand, he's known as a man after God's own heart. And on the other hand, we're going to see him fail terribly here. I'm going to summarize part of the story and then, uh, and then we'll get into Psalm 51 and, and see where David goes once he's been confronted with his sin. And so we'll, we'll be able to look at his failure and we'll be able to look at where he goes for restoration. So let's pray and then we'll get into the scriptures. Uh, Lord Jesus, as we uh, head towards Calvary, as we move towards the horrific torture you suffered. Help us to continue to be reminded of the beautiful gift that you've given us, the gift of salvation and eternal life in you. Not by anything that we did or didn't do, but our substance, our wholeness, our restoration, and our eternal seat at the heavenly banquet was purchased by you. And for that, we are grateful. But Lord, help us uh, to be convicted of where we need to repent, not be crushed with guilt, but to run to you for grace and mercy. That's our goal today. Be with us, we ask, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, many of you know the story of King David, where, uh, you know, David had these incredible conquests and unified Israel. They are one nation now. But as David grew in uh, knowledge and grew in 
people knowing him, his notoriety began to spread. He also got complacent, and we must be on guard from being complacent. Hey, Paula, it's vital for followers of Jesus Christ to not lose sight of the path that we're on. And David here in this passage in 2 Samuel begins to lose focus. And there's great disaster that comes from that. So we're going to pick up David's story in verse 12. Now by the time we get to verse 12, or not verse 12, chapter 12, by the time we get to 2 Samuel chapter 12, David has committed murder and adultery. He tells the servant to go get Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. God gave David a way of escape. He didn't take it. The servant says, hey, that's Uriah's wife. You know, king, just in case you don't know, I'm risking my own life by giving you this way out. And he didn't take it. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. And then for David, trying to cover his sin, calls Uriah back from the battle line, tries to get him drunk so that he will uh, have relations with Bathsheba, but he refuses. And after a couple of attempts, David finally sends Uriah back with his own death warrant. But he doesn't know. It's a secret message. And when Joab receives the message, hey, I want you to send Uriah to the hottest point of the battle. Send him to the front lines. And when it gets really bad, I want everyone to retreat except Uriah, thereby sealing his death. So David now has committed two sins in the Old Testament that were worthy of the death penalty. We pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him, with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arm. That's almost like saying the lamb sat at the table with them and ate. The lamb wasn't going to be raised for food. It was a family pet. And I know many of you are pet lovers. You have dogs, you have cats, whatever the case might be. And even if not, you still have a tender spot for animals. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take, that's the rich man, was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Now this tough prophet, Nathan, standing before the king, God's man standing before God's king, says, You are the man. And thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arm, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that were too little, I would have added to you much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? This greatly displeased the Lord, as you can imagine. Now we're going to jump to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and many of your headings will say that, uh, the, that this is the choir, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Well, after he had gone into Bathsheba, he also committed murder. And so now we're picking up the story where David is understanding the gravity of, 
of his sin. And he'd been hiding it for a while. Not from God, but he thought he was getting away with it. But David's soul was never settled. There's always, when we sin, one of the greatest gifts God gives us is the knot and the churning in our stomach. The sleepless night. David was fighting this off. And why are they a gift? Because they motivate us to go make right what we've done wrong. These are, these are gifts to keep us away from sin and keep us repentant and in a right relationship with God and those around us. What a terrible thing it would be if we were able to sin and not think anything of it. Just sin and be able to sleep at night as if everything is A-OK. And that might work for some for a while, but eventually, followers of Christ are so bogged down by their sin that the light finally switches on that says they must address it, face it, seek forgiveness, and repent. So here's David, Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here we see this again. Now we see iniquity and sin and transgressions. We've seen that in other Psalms, this pattern. David is covering all the bases where I violated your rules, where I've trespassed against someone else, where I've sinned and missed the mark. God's mark is holiness. And David's acknowledging, I missed it all. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Yeah, he experienced that. He understood it was before him. Because his body was aching. He was suffering physically because of what he had done and trying to hide it and cover it up. It's important for us to know we know intellectually God sees everything, but it's important for us to know spiritually in the heart that nothing escapes his vision. And now verse 4, we're going to read verse 4 and I'm going to pause. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Now, wait a minute. I thought David sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah. And that's true. But ultimately, all sin is against God. Now, most sin affects other people. But at the same time, you're sinning against someone created in the image of God, and therefore, you are sinning against God as well. Now, there are times in, in our private time, in our private life, where we can blaspheme God, we can, we can walk away, we, we can sin against God and God alone in a technical sense. But David here is acknowledging because Bathsheba and Uriah were made in the image of God, and David knew that adultery and murder were sin, he's stating the fact that, that, Lord, technically against you, you're the only one I sinned against because of your great love for Uriah and Bathsheba, because of their greatness. When we sin against God's creation, and you can pick it, whether it's human beings, animals, even our natural resources, it is a sin against a holy God. And as horrific of a, a thing that David did to Uriah and calling Bathsheba. Think about Bathsheba for a moment. Do you think she went willingly? Do you think this was something that she was looking forward to? Hey, you know, my husband's in battle 
I really hope the king calls me up to his palace. Probably not what was going on. And we don't see any of that in the scriptures. So how, how much of her complicity was she was being obedient to the supreme ruler of the land? David had a lot of sin on his place plate that he had to seek forgiveness for. And what's the first thing he does? He falls on the mercy of God. Now, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, inside. This is what God delights in when we're living in truth on the inside. When we're living authentic lives, when we've made repentance, when we've sought forgiveness, when we've righted what we've done wrong. Verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. All right, now let's back up for a minute. David acknowledges in verse 1, That he needs God's mercy. And he falls on God's steadfast love. Before he even apologizes, before he seeks forgiveness, he's calling on God's love. His steadfast love, according to his abundant mercy. Not that God needed to be reminded. But David is saying, look, before I get to anything, Lord, I, I need your mercy. I need your steadfast love. Then he says, wash me thoroughly. This is verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. There's the acknowledgement. I'm toast without you, Lord. You must wash me. I'm filthy on the inside. I can take a bath every single day, but it doesn't cleanse the inside. You, Lord, cleanse me from my sin. We're going to see later in Lent, and uh, as we go through... Uh, Holy Thursday and Good Friday, where Pontius Pilate tried to wash his hands of what he'd done to Jesus. But you, you can't wash that. Hey, Arlene, good morning. You can't wash that off. That's internal. And then he acknowledges he knows what he did. I know my transgressions. I know everything. It's, it's in front of me. At, it's daily in front of me. I can't get away from it. Then he says this word in verse 5. Behold, well, in verse 4, he acknowledges, gee, thanks, David, God really needed that pat on the back. But David acknowledges out loud that God's blameless in whatever judgment he meets out to David, which is a good place to be. I mean, we can tease David and say, hey, thanks, thanks for helping out God in that one. But honestly, David is acknowledging his position, meaning God is sovereign, he is just, He is merciful, and whatever he decides to punish David with, God's blameless in it. David has it coming. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, wait a minute. Is he trying to blame his mom, or is he saying that he was conceived illegitimately? No, I think what David is saying here, he's acknowledging that we are all born in sin. Even even if the relationship is righteous, by the fact of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, we are born into this. So I don't think he's trying to cop out here. I think he's acknowledging the state of every human being and the need for the Savior. That us, just like David, we were born into sin. And we've talked about it here before. I know it seems unfair, but you can see the picture of Jesus in the garden behind me. It wasn't fair what he's about to go through after this scene. Unfair that we take some of the blame for Adam and Eve, although we probably would have done the same thing. Also unfair that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, would live a life here in perfection and then give his life for us. 
And we're going to close with verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. David's asking for the relentless, the relentless of the turmoil in his soul to be removed. He's acknowledged his transgression. He's acknowledged his sin. He's acknowledged the fact that he violated God's laws. He fell on God's mercy, sought forgiveness, asked God to purge him, cleanse his soul. Now, we do that today through asking Christ to, to cleanse us, to, to wash us. That though our, our sins make us dirty on the inside, Christ's blood washes us clean from that, from the guilt of our sin. And then David says, let this joy come back to me. Restore the bones which you have broken. It's a euphemism for the pain that was caused by hiding my sin and not dealing with it. The best way to avoid that kind of pain is to acknowledge the sin immediately and do your best as fast as you can to not only repent, but to seek restoration. After you've done that, whatever happens after that is on the person that you have acknowledged your sin and sought forgiveness and apologized for. But really, the bottom line to all of this is David went to a sovereign God for forgiveness. Uh, for us today, that is Christ our Savior. Now here's two things. Number one, for those who don't know Christ, the first step is to repent and seek forgiveness from Jesus and receive Him as your Savior. Call upon His name, asking Him to forgive you of your sins and to wash you clean. And the second part is once we've surrendered our life to Christ and we continue to live, we must acknowledge and be on the lookout. Number one, let's not lose focus like David. Be on the lookout where we could stumble and fall so that we don't have to sin and then go seek forgiveness. But the other part is when we do sin, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ. The Lord of glory. We run to Him. And two things happen. One thing for sure. We restore a broken relationship. We tear down that wall that was between us and Jesus. And we get back into fellowship with Him. And the other thing is, is it opens the door for a renewed relationship. Many of you have experienced the relief of going to someone after you've gone to God. You've, you've received forgiveness from the Lord and your soul can breathe again. But there's still a tiny pit because we haven't made that step to seek forgiveness from the one we've wronged. And when we do, many of you know that incredible release. Even if that person does not want to accept your apology. You can rest in the Lord's hands because you've got forgiveness from the Lord and you have unburdened your soul. You've acknowledged your sin and you sought forgiveness and restoration from the one that you have wronged. And Paul says, that's all that we can do. The rest is up to the person that we've wronged. Seeking forgiveness as quickly as possible is a great gift to ourselves and it opens the door for God to do transformative work in us. And that is an incredible gift. So as we walk this life as broken individuals being healed on a daily basis, let us be reminded of the wonderful Savior we serve 
and that his arms are open for reconciliation, restoration, and welcoming. When we run to Jesus seeking forgiveness, he will not turn away. David's life is an, exempt, is an excellent example of that. Tomorrow, we will continue our study in Psalm 51. It's actually a, a, a beautiful psalm. It's some tough stuff for us to deal with. But we've said it here before. If we weren't sinners, we wouldn't need a Savior. The fact that a Savior came means we are sinners who need salvation. But let us rejoice that the picture of Jesus in the garden is not the end. He rules and reigns, sovereign, loving, and forgiving, and has opened access to his holy throne room for every single person ever born, from Adam and Eve until today. And today is March 15th, 2021. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are humbled and we are in awe of your radical love and your forgiveness. It's almost too much for us to take in that knowing everything about us, you still want to restore us. You still want a relationship with us. And you're not embarrassed to call us your own. Thank you for the blood that you shed on our behalf. Thank you for your resurrection that conquered sin and death for us. And thank you that you made a way of restoration between us and our Holy Creator and those around us. And may you continue this work of sanctification in all your people that each day we might look more like you. We pray it all, Father, in the victorious name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen, everybody. Now look, this was not about guilt. This is about hope and joy that we have in the Lord, that we actually have a place to go to, to be washed clean, and to have the chains and the burdens of guilt and sin removed, that we might live free and enjoy the abundant life Christ came to give us. Walk in His abundance today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day.